Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you again today. Uh, I just realized last night that over the last six years, I have given five of the New Year's sermons to this church. Hmm. It must be a great time for pastors to go on vacation and to leave it for people like me. So I've come to realize that. And so I, I obviously recognize as well that I have given you almost everything that you need to know about New Year's at this point, because obviously I've told you five times what you need to do. So I decided that, you know, I need to do something different, something a little fresh. And what I came up with was that um, we have just concluded the end of the holiday season. And with the end of the holiday season comes a terrible misunderstanding. And I believe that that misunderstanding is that we all of a sudden, as we take our Christmas presents, our gifts, and we put them back into the boxes, so do we take away the holiday spirit of gift and kindness. I have recognized that for nine months out of 12, we are completely barbarians to each other, and then spend three months being Consider it somewhat generous and compassionate to each other. If you think I'm joking, the day before the presidential election actually finished, we were, as, you know, chaos as a United States body. And then Trump was elected, and afterwards, no matter what side you took, you had an opinion on it, and it was very vocal and we became very violent to each other. And then all of a sudden Thanksgiving hit and a light switched on and we all sat around the family table talking about what we were thankful for. You know, we had the awkward situations where you asked a um, cousin or a nephew, you know, what were you thankful for? And they were still sitting there on their phone, not paying attention to the conversation at all. Be like, um, I'm thankful for my phone. And then they just go back to whatever they were doing. So we had awkward situations like that, and then all of a sudden Christmas starts, and everyone starts showing kindness and compassion to each other as they start giving gifts and different things. And we talk about holiday cheer, we decorate left and right with beautiful things of the Christmas season, and New Year's comes along, and we talk about all these things that we're not going to accomplish, and then we just trail back into the same routine of being rude and disheartening to each other, for another nine months until Thanksgiving hits again. This is the problem, and I'm not the only one that sees it. There is a popular YouTube artist by the name of Peter Hollins, and he is one of those one-man choirs. He gets together with a group of people, and they film him over and over and over again, and he, as one voice, sings multiple parts of a song to create his own little choir. And one of the songs that he did recently was called the December Song. And the December Song has the first verse that goes like this. It says, In December, we give our gifts, wishing well to our world. Peace on earth to everyone. It's a time to be joyful when all is calm and all is bright. But why does it change with the seasons? And why can't we just hold on to silent nights, holy nights, and angels singing lullabies, and heaven and nature singing goodwill to all, to all. Today I want to talk about that issue of kindness, the same thing that Peter Hollins is addressing in his song. Is it possible for humanity to actually be kind to each other 100% of the year? Is it possible for man to actually put aside their differences and show some compassion to each other? Or are, am I just, you know, dancing in the wind here and dreaming up possibilities that are not actually plausible. So today we're going to be looking into Scripture to see what the Bible actually says about the topic of kindness, and we're going to come up with three simple things that the Bible says about it and how it can impact us directly today. As we do that, let's pray. Father God, I thank you that we have the opportunity to be here together. I pray that you be with each and every one of us as we go through your word. Guide us and help us to learn something new that we may not have considered before. And may you be at the center of it all. This is our prayer, in Jesus' name, amen. So, 
The first place that we want to look is in Luke. So open with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. In Luke chapter 6, we have the first big thing that we can learn about kindness here. And this is to be kind to our enemies. In Luke 6 chapter 35, it says, But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Now, we've heard this verse before. It's one of the things that we like to proclaim as a church, that we want to show love and compassion to everyone. We want to be kind. And one of the biggest stretches of it is to be kind to your enemies. If you can be kind to your enemies, then you can also be kind to everyone in between, from your best friend to your enemy, all of them. And so that's a great principle. But something that I want to point out in this is that there's no timeline for this kindness. It doesn't say, like it does in some of the books back in Leviticus and Deuteronomy as laws, where it has a specific timeline in which you have to apply these things. This is universal. It doesn't say that you can only do it for the sixth day or the seventh day, for the first month, for the first year. It doesn't say that. It just says love. Just love. And I think that that's something really important for us today. So not only is this text saying, be, love, be loving to your enemies, but being loving is a universal principle that does not have a time. The example that I want to give was given to, by Jordan in our call of worship in Luke chapter 10. So flip over to it, and we're going to be looking at the parable of the Good Samaritan. We know the background information towards this parable. Jesus was sitting down, and a man of the law comes up to him and starts trying to question him. And he tries to you know, ask him, uh, what is you know, the most important thing in the text? What is written in the law? And this guy answers, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And he gets down to the question of who is my neighbor. And in verse 30, Jesus answers. He says, a certain man went down to Jerusalem, to Jericho, and he fell amongst thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Well, this actually makes sense. Because normally, when a Jew is passing from Jerusalem to Jericho, it means only one thing. It's the Day of Atonement. That was the only reason why someone would actually go above and beyond to travel from one city to another throughout the year. You had to go to this service to partake in this one time of the year event. So, if the Jew has to go there, certainly the priest has to go as well. It would make no sense if the priest just happened to walk by and sees this guy. He's going to be participating in it. And one of the most uncleanly things that you can have on you during the Day of Atonement is blood. If you have blood on you, you become ceremonially unclean and are no longer allowed to participate in the Day of Atonement. So rather than doing something that is kind and compassionate towards this guy, he avoids the trouble and hassle of having to go through this whole rigorous cleansing process by just not doing anything. And continues on his merry way as he passes by on the other side. But he's not alone. In verse 32, it says, Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. Well, we know if a priest is going to do this, so too is a Levite. Levite is a descendant of the tribe of Aaron, and is in the household of the high priest. So he has the same rigorous activities as the priest would to participate in the Day of Atonement. So he also would not be willing to stop and lend a hand, even though it should be expected of him. He is a man of God, right? So by all means, he should have been the one to stop and do what was right in terms of the times. But we see instead in verse 33 that a Samaritan who, as he journeyed, came to where he was, he being the man that was robbed, and he saw him and he had compassion. 
So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Now the Samaritans are not in a good place with the Jews. Do we know why they are not in good standing? Well, if you don't, today is a good lesson. Because back in 700s, part of the Israelite nation was taken over siege by the Assyrians. And in the 700s, the people that were split in half from the tribe of Judea were then courted to be part of the Assyrians and became half-breeds known as Samaritans. To the Jews, you had to be a pure Jew in order to receive the salvation of man. So if you were a half-breed, you were not fit to be part of this new salvation that God was offering his people. And you had violated the covenant. So a Samaritan, in the eyes of a Jew, were heathens. And that would go the other way. If you have somebody who's constantly telling you that you're going to surmount to nothing, your life is a pitiful existence, you're not going to like the person very much. So the hatred between these two were equal. And we also know that, it, that the Jews, in terms of our time in history, they fell to the Babylonians in 586. So it was a 200-year process between the original Jews falling in 7, 722 and then 586, the rest of the Jews were taken over by the Babylonians. So that's the split between the Samaritans and the Jews. They do not like each other. And yet it's this Samaritan in the parable that shows up and goes above and beyond to take care of this guy. It says he bandaged him, he poured oil and wine, he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn. Back then, oil and wine is not cheap. It is a very expensive item to purchase. So this guy went above and beyond by reaching out of his own pocket to pull out something that is very expensive. And not only that, it is not a short walk from Jerusalem to Jericho. And somewhere in between, and he lets this guy sit on his animal, and he walks the whole way? That's not easy. And then he takes him to an inn, and as it says, he put out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come, I will repay you. Can you imagine somebody coming up today and found out that you were placed in the hospital and they said, without insurance, I will pay it in full? Yeah, right. That ain't going to happen. And so in the parable, this is the expression of going above and beyond to take care of somebody in a way that you would not expect. And so when the, Jesus finally sits down at the end, he says, which of these three do you think was the neighbor to him who fell amongst the thieves? And they said, the one who shows mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Again, for the Samaritan, it was not an issue of when I have to do it. He just did it. He had compassion on him. And he just felt the need to do it to somebody who he has absolutely no reason to ever appreciate or admire in life. And so, we can learn from this first process that it's not just loving your enemies, but that love is not something that has a specific time. It is universal. So that's number one. Number two. Number two is a fun one. And that is that we don't have to wait until everything is perfect to be generous to others. As I describe this a little more, I invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 17. And this is the story of Elijah and the woman of Zarephath. So in this story, Elijah has already gone above and beyond to argue with the king and to tell everybody that it's not going to rain until God permits it again. And he's been down to the river. He's been fed manna by ravens. And the river has dried up. And so now he needs to move to a new place. So in 1 Kings chapter 17, at the very beginning, he, God tells uh, Elijah in verse 9, he says, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. 
And he goes down, and in paraphrasing, when he gets, when he gets down to the place, he sees this woman and asks her for bread and water. Now this woman, as she sees it, she says, uh, let's see, where is it? In verse 12, she says, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And most of us know the story after this. We know that Elijah tells her, don't worry about it. Feed me and yourself, and the next day your jar will not run dry and your bread will not run out. And she has the faith to take that leap of faith and try it, because what does she have to lose at that point? And sure enough, God provides the whole way through. Now, something that's interesting in this verse is that in verse 12, which is part of the reason why I read it, is when she says, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread. As the Lord your God lives. This means that the woman actually knows who Elijah is. She knows that Elijah is a prophet and a man of God. Yet she sits there with nothing in her wallet, in her pockets, and she still does not have the faith that God, the God who serves Elijah, will serve her. Interesting. So she has to take a step of faith into a God that she doesn't even believe in and go and do what he says. Now, she did not have anything. One of the interesting things that was also mentioned in the USAV school today that I think is interesting is this part of gifts. Uh, I mentioned it with the wise men, and it fits so well into our sermon. Back then in Hebrew culture, you were supposed to give a gift as a formal tradition in Hebrew culture. And depending on who it was that you were meeting, depended on the size of the gift. But it was guaranteed. When you walked up, the father of the household, you had to give a gift. And you can see this actually in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 27. When Saul became king and they didn't approve of him, it says that they did not provide him presents. So if you gave a present, it was a sign of respect. If you did not show any sort of present or gift to the person, it was an insult to them as a leader and father of the household, which makes the birth of Jesus with the three wise men giving gifts even more relevant. But here, as a formal tradition, the woman is supposed to give a gift to Elijah as a formal meeting, and she does not even have the means to provide a gift to Elijah in this scenario. So this woman literally has nothing, yet when Elijah asks, she still has the kindness and compassion towards him. So I think that that is something interesting that normally for us, we like to sit there and wait and say, hold on, hold on. I want to do something, but wait until I have X, Y, and Z checked off on my list. Wait until I have the means to do it. Wait until I have the time. Wait until I have stable, stable, stable. And we don't actually allow God to be the God of miracles that he is. So that's part number two. Part number two is that we don't have to wait till everything is perfect to be generous to others. The third is to be kind, just as God is kind to others, and goodness, kindness spreads. Have you ever heard the nickname for David, King David? He was a man after, a man after God's own heart. Why? Why is David a man after God's own heart? You know, normally when we talk about that, we also like to point out the whole issue that he has with Uriah and the terrible adultery scandal that we have. And we say, see, look at this man. He's such a sinner, yet somehow he also has the title of being a man after God's own heart. Isn't that weird? But we ignore the fact of what David actually did as a king from 1 Samuel all the way through the book of 2 Samuel, where he is constantly showing kindness and compassion to people that did not deserve it. You think that I am joking? I will prove you wrong. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, verses 14 through 15, both Saul and Jonathan, father and son, are killed in the same war. Yet he goes, as David, to the family 
and child of Jonathan, grandson of Saul, and, go, and shows kindness and compassion towards him in that verse. And so afterwards, the family actually acknowledges him, and all the soldiers are appreciating him for what he does. When he actually dies, when Saul actually dies, David, who has no reason to show kindness to him whatsoever because Saul has tried to kill him multiple times, he comes in and gives Saul a proper burial. And when he does, all the men in 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 5, say, because you have shown kindness, so will we show kindness to you. And you can see that continue into 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 6 as well. You also have 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1, where David is being kind to Saul's family specifically because of Jonathan. And in 9, verse 7, he shows kindness and later offers a seat to the table of, bear with me, Mehiboseth. Try saying that one five times fast. Mehiboseth. For as long as he lives, Mahiboseth is allowed to sit at the palace table to eat with the king. That's quite an offer. Also, you have in 2 Samuel chapter 10, verses 2 through 4, where he shows kindness to another family member of Saul named Hanun. So throughout David's life, and this is only up to 2 Samuel chapter 10, you have all the way through the book of David showing kindness. And there are double, if not triple, the amount of kindness that David shows throughout these two books. So there's a reason that he is called a man after God's own heart. And even Ellen White has a pretty awesome quote. It says that great had been David's fall, and referring to his incident of adultery and murder, great had been David's fall, but deep was his repentance. Ardent was his love, and strong his faith. For he had, for, he had been forgiven of much, and therefore he loved much. It's interesting because when we look at David, and we look at his life, it was not something that he actually did by himself. It was a process that he had to go through. As Ellen White also points out in Patriarchs and Prophets, both of these quotes are from Patriarchs and Prophets, She also mentions that it was because he served early as a shepherd that he was able to have the humility to serve as a king. And so there are definitely situations in life where God will put us in places to repair us for something that we did not anticipate. So here are the three main points that we can learn from kindness in the Bible. We have that the Bible teaches us to be kind to our enemies and that it is a universal principle. We have that we don't have to wait till everything is absolutely perfect in order to be generous to others. And the other thing that we learned is to be kind as God is kind to others, and this kindness spreads. In the same way that David showed kindness to others, they reciprocated by showing kindness back to him. It's pay it forward, really. So how can we actually do this? Because we just pointed out that we can be kind for about three months and then we spend nine months being complete barbarians to each other. How can we actually do this so that it does become a universal point in our life? Well, we can pick this up from both David and Elijah. In both of these situations, David does not do this by his own means, nor does Elijah do this by his own means. It comes by having that constant communion relationship with God. It is not something that I'm just going to pick up my books, walk out of here into life, and just be like, I'm going to be perfect. I'm going to be kind to everybody. It's just going to happen. It's not done by my own measures. It comes by constantly communing and talking with God. And we can see that. You look at David. David was constantly talking to God, constantly communing with him, having the faith to stand up to Goliath, having faith to listen to God when Saul is confronting him, going through every single step of his life trying to follow God. And when he didn't follow God, we see what happens. Hence, adultery and murder of Uriah. So we can see what God can do when he's leading in people's lives. Also, we mentioned Elijah. Elijah was so gifted as a prophet and so in communion with God that as soon as she showed up, the woman of Zarephath instantly knew who he was, instantly knew that he was a prophet. You only know that if he he had actually spent time with God. 
So, in order to actually have this kind of kindness that we're talking about today, that is not something that is just done three months out of the year. It takes an actual time of commitment and time with God. And I've come to realize that there is one great gift today. One great gift that you can give to people. And that greatest gift does not come as something that comes out of your pocket. It's not something you can just open up your wallet and say, here, I have, you know, a 20 or whatever. Let me just, you know, give it out to you and, and all is well. You know, this is not what we're talking about. And it's not just like the parable of the rich young man where he sits there and says, oh, I, I'm going to bandage you up in different things. The greatest gift that I have come to realize that you can give to another person is time. It is time. And time is not something that you can actually pinpoint and say that I have and somebody else doesn't. Because it is true that, diff- that people have different amounts of time on earth and people have different scenarios of how they're trying to accomplish things in life. Every single person has a 24-hour day. No matter what. Today is 24 hours. Tomorrow is 24 hours. The greatest gift that you can show somebody is time. I have participated in a couple of volunteer services over at my time in Michigan. And the times that I spent out there, it was the time that was taken out to be with the people, to help them out, that made a bigger impact in their life than what we gave them. And so the greatest gift that you can offer to somebody else is time. My question and challenge for you today is what are you going to do with that time? We live in Santa Clarita. Santa Clarita is a very nice place. You don't walk around and just instantly see somebody in the corner that looks like they're homeless. You don't just have this area that says, oh, look, he needs help. He needs help. He needs help. But I guarantee you that there are people sitting in here today that are in some form of pain and suffering. We don't even think about it. We just think as we walk into church that everything's going to be fine and we greet each other, we handshake and we say, oh, happy Sabbath. But we don't recognize that the person right next to us could be in a serious pain, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And so today my challenge to you is not to look for the kindness to show it, but to recognize that kindness is something that just needs to happen. And so my question again for you today is what are you going to do with the time that you are given? Are you going to spend that time being kind? Or are you going to spend that time being cruel? Are you going to spend that time dwelling on stuff for yourself? Or are you going to spend that time dwelling on it for others? This is the challenge that I have to you today. And I am excited to see what you do with the challenge that I have presented to you today.